Uh, my name is Ryan Udell. I'm the president of the Students for Exploration and Development Space here at Rice University. Um, today we have an amazing academic careers in the space industry panel uh, full of our lovely Rice professors. Um, this panel was put together by our very own Fenny Pandia and uh, Rosemary Moss will be uh, the moderator for this panel. So everyone give a welcome to Rosemary. So to start things off, could each of our panelists introduce themselves and give a brief introduction as to what it is that they do? Uh, I'm Andrew Long, professor of the physics and astronomy department. Uh, my work is in theoretical cosmology and particle physics, so I study the first fractions of the second after the Big Bang. Uh, my name is uh, David Alexander. I'm also in physics and astronomy. Um, my area is source with physics originally, but I'm now working on exoplanet uh, characterization. Uh, I also am um, the director of the Space Institute, so I work a lot with, uh, of course, the student organizations here and uh, NASA and Space Institute. My name is Kirsten Seabrock, and I'm an assistant professor in the Earth Environmental and Planetary Sciences Department, and I work on the geology of Mars, especially the geochemistry and sedimentology observed by the Mars rovers and help with the Mars Rover operations team. Uh, my name is Patrick Brody. I'm a professor in the practice in the mechanical engineering department. I'm basically an aerospace engineer and, and teach a variety of different aerospace engineering courses. Uh, my specialty is hypersonic aerodynamics and aerothermal dynamics, vehicle design and optimization. Okay, so for our first question, what, interest you, what interested you in the space field and why did you choose to study and to study what you study and to pursue a career in space. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess I've always been interested in uh, space physics um, from watching Carl Sagan as a kid and reading popular science articles and books in high school. Um, and then I had the opportunity to study physics in college and pursue that uh, in graduate school as well. I think what excited me most was the mysteries of the universe, that most of the universe is filled with substances like dark matter that we just don't understand. And uh, it's an exciting time to try to uh, develop theories to explain the universe that we live in and how it came to be the way it is. I think we can all probably say the same. I mean, I think you grow up um, being fascinated by whatever aspect of science or, or the universe in, in our case um, just catches your attention. I think just to add a little bit of a different side of things on the Space Institute side, I actually went from university to work at Lockheed Martin designing uh, space missions to study the sun and that kind of gave me uh, a real excitement in being able to combine the science with the engineering aspects and making things happen and working to get the data and then moving to Houston um, just the opportunity to work with the Human Space Flight Program and to meet uh, some of the, the folks who were there in the day, in the Gemini, Mercury days, and through the Apollo and the Space Shuttle days. And so that's kind of fueled my kind of passion in the last 10 years um, of sort of pushing the human space flight aspect and the Rice Space, Rice space Institute's uh, hopefully contribution to that, but also sort of the public awareness of it too. So, um, it's a kind of rich array when you put your mind to it, and, and we're all about solving problems and being in a position to learn something new every day, and I think that uh, applies to whatever field that we have to be in. Um, I came to studying space actually a little bit kind of from the outside. I really liked science and exploration, and when I was going to college, I uh, heard about these programs where you could do science outdoors, so I started studying geology. Um, and got really excited about that, but then uh, managed to work on a project related to the Mars rovers. And, uh, and the kind of enthusiasm and uh, the way that you can inspire people with the pictures of the Mars, from the Mars rovers, I got really excited about being able to share that science um, and also to contribute to it. And I, um, I got really excited about working with the teams of people that work in space. They have to be very interdisciplinary teams, and uh, and I get to work with teams of people who all love their job. And so I kind of came around to space after knowing that I liked 
puzzles and geology and the outdoors and these kind of questions, um, but then applying them to space has really uh, helped me find kind of the group that I was most excited to be part of. Um, I started out as an airplane guy. Uh, when I was a little kid, I always wanted to be an airline pilot. Uh, but I don't have the world's greatest vision, so I figured out I had to do something different. And my father actually bought uh, an encyclopedia for like, STEM subjects. And in there was a listing for aeronautical engineer. And I read that, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I could do that. And so I always was doing airplanes, interested in uh, aerodynamics specifically. And then when I looked at colleges and graduate school, I said, oh, wow, you know, we could do this high-speed stuff, the hypersonic stuff. I really love the fact that if you don't design the vehicle properly, the wings burn off. It's very dramatic, you know, fun stuff like that. Then we're able to uh, apply the same, uh, these same techniques to reentry vehicles, uh, spacecraft going into Mars, and other types of applications. Uh, and anything I could do to contribute to the exploration of the solar system. That's what I'm very excited about. And I think that's why we, we learn from engineers. I mean, the scientists would just say, yeah, the wings will fall off, but at least we would understand why. Um, the engineers sort of say, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> Okay, so could each of our panelists just talk a little bit about the work that you're sort of doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. Um, so, as I said, I, uh, I'm using the tools of theoretical particle physics to address questions in the study of early universe cosmology. So if you were to think about what the conditions of the universe were like in those first fractions of the second half of the Big Bang, it would be very different from the universe that we uh, see today and are exploring. Um, there were planets or stars or galaxies. Uh, the universe at that time was filled with an extremely hot plasma containing all of the known particles, um, the ones that we're familiar with, like electrons and photons, but also more exotic particles like top quarks and Higgs bosons. And understanding the conditions of that extreme environment and uh, developing theories to explain it um, is the essence of my work. And um, in addition to developing those theories, then uh, the, any good theory it has to be tested. Mm -hmm. And testing these types of theories is kind of unique in the sense that we can't recreate those conditions of the Big Bang in the laboratory today. And so what we rely on are cosmological relics that were produced at that time and then survived with us today. So for example, uh, I mentioned that the universe is filled with dark matter, and theories such as the ones I study will uh, allow us to predict the properties and interactions of the dark matter and uh, how it was created in the uh, fireball after the Big Bang. Um, so the day-to-day -day work, though, is developing these theories, doing calculations, making predictions for um, a variety of different observables that we had uh, accessible to us that probed our kind of universe today. Uh, it might need to be quite different. Um, on the science side, the nice thing to do is to have a couple of really good students, actually, I'm looking at them right now. Um, so they kind of do a lot of day-to-day -day science, and then you meet with them and discuss their ideas and your ideas and where things are going, and I think that's the I think the greatest value of being at a university where you can work with uh, students, you see their excitement, that they're learning every day, they're teaching you stuff every day because they go and bring a different perspective to, to some things and things that you take for granted sometimes turn out to be wrong and, and so it's great to have that environment. Um, the other thing, uh, again, because I can do two different hats on the engineering side, um, I help, for instance, with the space program. I mean, I can talk about many different there, but the idea is how do we get technology that we're developing, like, say, in a bio uh, uh, lab, and translate that into the human space lab. How do we take uh, robotic technologies that are being developed from the medical center here in Houston and have that translate over to NASA or vice versa? And so that's a really interesting aspect. I don't have to do the work myself. I don't have to know all the details. I just have to understand enough to put people together and have an idea of how these things might benefit our students, our faculty, uh, NASA, the companies around us. Um, I've just been working with a company uh, from Scotland 
who have got this interesting technology to help the psychological effects of time delayed communications. So when astronauts go to Mars and are trying to communicate with their families at home, you're in a tin can with three of your probably originally most favourite people and probably 500 days later your least favourite people. And so being able to manage that psychological side, I know nothing about this. But I do know it's a need for NASA and these, these companies are looking to make that connection. And so it's absolutely fantastic to be able to have that, those kind of conversations. And I don't know if it would happen as well anywhere else but in Houston. And I think that's, that's a great, great aspect of um, it makes you want to come to work every day when you don't really know what's going to happen. Yeah, I agree with David. It kind of changes on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, that's certainly a work students is one of the best one of the best parts and with our science we are kind of monitoring the data that's coming down from the rover so sometimes I'm on teleconferences with the rover team as we're either analyzing data that's just come down and trying to make sure that we kind of capture the most interesting things before the rover drives on uh, or telling the rover kind of what to do the next day uh, but then in terms of the data analysis we take that and we think about what kind of experiments or models or uh, terrestrial analog field sites, places on Earth that act like um, the aspect of Mars that we're trying to reproduce, uh, we can use to best understand that data. And so in my group, we're working on you know, rivers in Iceland and modeling magmas um, and doing experiments with magmas and kind of doing all these things to, to constrain um, the different variables that the Curiosity rover is observing right now. Well, to be honest with you, on a day-to-day -day basis, I spend a lot of time preparing lectures for class and making homework problems. And Somebody stuff. has to. <laughs> Somebody has to do that. <laughs> uh, in terms of the science, uh, right now I'm working on a variety of different hypersonic vehicle concepts. Uh, this, again, involves working with different students. Uh, we're applying some advanced technology, uh, advanced uh, analysis techniques, and optimization techniques. Uh, for many years, I was using genetic algorithms. Uh, now I'm changing to particle swarm optimization. That seems to work a little bit better. Then we can mix in a little bit of artificial intelligence to enhance the, the tentativity, if you will, for some of these optimizations. Uh, so working on vehicle design really is, is the primary point at this point. Okay. So what is the biggest challenge of working in this field? Um, so. My work is inherently theoretical in nature, uh, and I'm developing theories for uh, epoch in the cosmic history that, as I said, we're not able to directly recreate the conditions of the universe today. And so one of the challenges is that in addition to being uh, intelligent uh, and clever about um, doing careful calculations, one also has to be very creative. And I think Learning creativity is not something that we do in school. Uh, we take classes to be good at mechanics or electricity and magnetism, um, and we learn how to absorb the information that's available in textbooks and lectures. But uh, really, research in all fields, of course, um, really requires a level of ingenuity and creativity, being able to say, uh, I think uh, this is the correct theory for dark matter. This is what the universe was like. And um, being able to uh, stick your neck out a little bit and uh, be bold and uh, uh, develop new ideas and extend knowledge in that way. That's a challenge for me. Um, I hate to say this, but money. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the challenges is how you get funding for students and how you, how you bring these things. Um, and that is also true for how you get some of these new ideas going and translate these technologies across. So that's the kind of prosaic side of things, you know, that's, that's something that we all have to struggle with. One of the challenges we have in, in the science side is we are taking solar physics and uh, space physics tools, the understanding of the sun and the earth as a system, and trying to translate that into these new systems in which exoplanets, there's about 4,000 planets in discovered around other stars. And the challenge there, there's a, there's a funding challenge, I won't, I won't go into it, it's be boring there, but, but the challenge there is we don't have enough information about these new systems to know whether our ideas and, and the applications of those ideas um, 
really translate. And so what we're trying to do is bridge that gap by predicting what we think the expected observation be the radio emissions from the planet, um, the extreme ultraviolet radiation from the star. Um, and that means you have to develop a whole new suite of modeling tools. You have to up your game um, because, for example, we have survived on the planet for almost the, the entire history of the Earth, so about four billion years. And so we know that the sun's really good to us. But if you're Proxima Centauri, where the star is producing 50 giant solar flares every day, and your planet is about, what is it, uh, Alison can help me here, but it's much closer in than Mercury is to our sun. It supposedly has liquid water, which is great if you want to live on it. But you're going to get fried by the star. So we're trying to translate some of those activities um, into those realms, and then ultimately convince the astronomers that our ideas are appropriate for what they're trying to do. Um, and so that's the challenge: that is, can we create an environment uh, that has an observable, a testable hypothesis? In other words, like most science does, but observable consequences that are actually achievable, because these stars are very far away. One could argue that the planets are producing lots of radio emission, but if you can't observe it, then you know he's going to believe it. So that's that's something that we're sort of looking towards. It's a sort of new area, and uh, these planets are sort of standard. We'll see them all the time. Uh, well, I have to agree that money and time and creativity are all major challenges. <laughs> um, thinking about my field in particular, one of the challenges that I see that uh, that, that is a real challenge is, for example, you know, we're driving a rover on Mars. We've got one robot driving across the surface. We have about 400 to 500 scientists deciding what it does every day. You've been on a road trip, right? That, that's not a good, I mean, two people in the car, even if there are already highways, you can't decide which way to go. Um, and so a lot of the challenge is in communication. Uh, communication of our science, communication, because we have to work on these interdisciplinary teams, and so you really have to be able to communicate why it is important to do a specific observation, um, and then communicate the importance of those observations and the findings that you've made uh, to the broader public. And so I find that kind of communication and interdisciplinary teamwork are you know, both a huge reward and a challenge, um, because because you really do have to kind of know your stuff and then learn how to explain it in all different languages, right? To the scientists, to the engineers, to all these groups uh, to keep forwarding the science and make sure that, you know, we keep going, we've got more rovers on Mars, we've got more to investigate. Yeah, I like your answer. Um, collaboration between different groups, different disciplines, and different languages, trying to come up with an optimum design. You've got to use you know the right materials. You got to fly it correctly. It's got to be shaped properly. There's a lot of different uh, uh, disciplines that all have to talk to each other. A lot of times they use different terminologies, sort of a different vibe of like communication. And so trying to make sure everybody's on the right page, they're not talking past each other. Those are really big challenges. And another one kind of goes back to funding. You could have a great idea, but sometimes it's it's hard to find the right person that's going to get really excited about it. Once you found that person, yeah, usually it's pretty easy for funding if it's a good idea to, to, uh, to get that going. But you gotta find the right person in the right agency or the right location uh, to uh, really react to what your idea is. All right, so in your opinion, what is the um, greatest advancement in this field in the past five years? Um, one uh, very exciting thing that's happened uh, in my field recently, it may have been just about five years ago, was the discovery of gravitational waves from the merger of black holes by uh, telescope, the LIGO gravitational wave interferometer experiment. Um, so this is a program that's been going on for decades and it's finally culminated about five years ago in their first measurement of two black holes uh, in some distant galaxy um, merging and the colossal energies that were involved in that merger produced uh, gravitational waves that then propagated across the universe and uh, using two little uh, experiments in Washington State and in uh, Louisiana we were able to detect that uh, essentially ripple in space-time. And there 
first discovery, which was about five years ago, was just the first of many. So now they've got dozens of these observations, and by observing gravitational waves in this way, um, on the one hand, we're learning things about astronomy, um, what types of black holes are present throughout the universe, and informs our models for how they were created from the collapse of stars. Um, it provides some tantalizing uh, questions of whether those black holes that we've seen actually were produced from the collapse of stars, or whether they may actually be cosmological relics um, from that early universe period, uh, and whether they may, for instance, be the dark matter. And uh, But moreover, the fact that we can now see gravitational waves with these types of telescopes uh, completely opens a new window on astronomy. We no longer are just doing astronomy by looking out into space, uh, waiting for the light to come to us, or waiting for sometimes particle emissions and neutrinos, for instance, to come to us. Uh, here, we're able to do astronomy uh, with a completely new medium, and that's really going to have uh, profound effects uh, for, the, for decades to come. Uh, I think it's actually hard to argue that this, this like gravitational wave discovery is, is uh, just immense. I mean, I, I was in the physics department as a student a long time ago in Glasgow, where that's what they did was try and detect gravitational waves, and there's really developing lasers yeah. um, to do the experiments. I think um, on our side of the science side, I think um, obviously the discovery of these new planets and the fact that some of them are in habitable zones, at least traditional habitable zones, has driven a whole energy within the community and also the, uh, the solar community. On the solar side, we just launched a satellite that is passing through, as we speak, the atmosphere of the sun. And that's just an a, a engineering feat, a miracle of how you is. The heat shield is so good that it's 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which can melt lead on one side, and room temperature, or Houston room temperature, 80 degrees Fahrenheit on the other side. And it hardly weighs anything. Um, so that's just a, 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 a huge thing for us, and we're looking at it's still going to get closer still in the next few orbits. It's going to uh, get within about 8 million miles of the solar surface. Um, we just got first light on the, the, uh, the, the uh, advanced, used to be called the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, so that's going to revolutionize solar physics. Parker, uh, sorry, the Solar Orbiter the European mission is going to launch next week, which is going to go out of the ecliptic plane and close the sun. Huge amounts of stuff happening. I was going to say with my other hat, I've just been so excited about growth of uh, the commercial space industry and the, 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 the excitement that they are bringing to space exploration and the potential for us to expand our capabilities and presence in space and I think that's been a huge growth in the last 10 years and there's no sign of it kind of stopping uh, anytime soon. Yeah, I have to, I mean the, the commercial space industry for me is exciting because it's a big influence for us too. Uh, in terms of Mars studies, what we're actually learning about the surface about five or six years ago was when we came out with, uh, when we first discovered a lake on Mars, an ancient lake bed, not a current lake, sorry, there's no liquid water on Mars today, uh, but a lake bed that represents something that was a habitable environment about three and a half billion years ago. And so now we know for sure from evidence on the ground that there were places on Mars that Earth-like life could have happily lived. This was a lake, it was neutral pH, um, it had all the elements required for life, it had organic material, at least in um, minor forms, uh, reduced carbon. Uh, and, and it lasted for at least tens of thousands of years since then. We've discovered it probably lasted for millions of years uh, on the surface of Mars. And so that pushes us to really see Mars as a place where life could have developed. It was right around the same time as life was developing on Earth. Um, and now, as we pick our next landing site and kind of set up our next missions, we're really refocusing to say, okay, this was a place where life really could have developed. Let's, let's find the evidence of that life. Well, I think uh, as an engineer, I'm always very impressed with SpaceX. I love watching their Falcon 9 first stage comes out and on, land on the land or land on the ship. Uh, the fact that he's using them three, four, five times and counting is just tremendous. I think the impact of that is still yet to be seen because that sort of cheap access to space is going to open up a whole lot of other opportunities in science, in business, and all sorts of different aspects of, of the colonization and exploration of space. 
Um, within hypersonics specifically, this is sort of another golden age. Uh, unfortunately, the political climate of the world has sort of forced the United States to spend some money on hypersonics, but there is a lot of uh, exciting hypersonic work going on. Most of it's on the military side. But a lot of those uh, techniques and, and design concepts also have civilian applications, such as trying to get uh, large payloads down on the surface of Mars, for instance. Okay. And for our last question before we open it up to the audience, what advancements do you see coming um, in the next decade? Um, I guess continuing what I was saying earlier about uh, gravitational waves, um, one of the things that will happen in the next 10 years or so is moving uh, gravitational wave observatories into space. Um, so this is already a project that's underway in Europe, the LISA uh, space-based gravitational wave interferometer. And in space, um, one isn't constrained by the curvature of the Earth, you can make the interferometer bigger and bigger, uh, millions of kilometers big. And by increasing the size of the telescope, you're accessing uh, lower wavelength gravitational waves. Um, and a lot of uh, my work in particular has studied a period um, in our cosmic history during which the Higgs field, which is the associated with the particle that gives uh, mass to uh, the electrons, for instance, of the particle in San uh, during the period in which this Higgs field was relevant and uh, may have created a gravitational wave noise that would uh, be uncoverable by a space-based interferometer experiment like Lisa. People have been uh, waiting, uh, I don't say patiently, but eagerly uh, for many decades now to have access to a telescope like that, which would really provide a new way of testing for the presence of cosmological relics in our universe, um, allowing us to explore to these um, very early periods in the present history. Um, well, I could talk a lot about science, um, what we're excited about, but I think, actually, I'm, what I'm really excited I think we will have a human presence on the moon in this next decade. You know, it might not be the sustainable presence that we're pushing for, and I think we have to keep Congress out of the way in order for it to happen. But I think uh, I think there will be something on the moon in which humans can go and live in. Uh, and that's, I think, we really exciting. A lot of people are working towards that. Um, and I think we'll make it, I'm maybe jumping on Patrick here, but uh, he can, he can uh, again say what I'm saying, but we, I think we'll have been a little bit closer to point-to-point -point transportation using uh, space planes on the Earth, so using the network of space ports that we're um, that will require at least advanced supersonics, if not hypersonics. Um, uh, so 10 years is maybe a little bit optimistic, but um, we'll, I think we'll have made significant progress towards that. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Uh, for Patrick, what do you we are just, right now, we're planning a, a mission that will launch later this year um, called Mars 2020 right now. It will get a name soon. Uh, and that one will go to Mars and then spend the next several years collecting about three dozen samples uh, that we're hoping to bring back. They're, they're going to be about the size of your pinky. It will be followed by two more missions. One of them will land, grab all the samples. The <coughs> Mars 2020 is just going to leave them in a pile on the ground. So then we'll send another rover, grab them from the ground, put them in a launch vehicle, launch them into orbit around Mars. And a third mission will come from Earth and grab them from orbit and bring them back to Earth. Won't be quite in the next decade. We're getting closer though. <laughs> It'll be just over a decade probably since we haven't quite launched that first first mission. Uh, but we are really looking forward to bringing the first selected samples back from Mars. And that's also definitely the first step in sending people towards Mars is proving that we can bring something back. Well, I think overall, in terms of impacts in the next 10 years for society, I think you're going to see a lot more continued applications of artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. I think those are going to be much more, much higher proliferation than we've got now. I think there'll be a whole variety of different applications uh, that people haven't even thought about now to come out. Uh, in terms of aerospace, yes, we would like to see those point-to-point -point hypersonic vehicles. That'll be a lot of fun especially when you're sitting on that plane going to China or someplace, and you're there for you know, 12 hours or whatever. Um, but also, I think for our field, we need some more materials. We need some good high temperature materials. We need materials that can take 
high heating rates as well as an integrated high heat load. And that's kind of an enabler for some of the aerodynamic concepts that, that I'm working on. So that's what I like to see happen in the next 10 years. Okay, so now we're going to open it up to the audience. If any of you all have any questions, you can just raise your hand and ask. So we have a question from online. Um, Kerry Rayner that is asking, uh, what new development, new technology, company, or policy in the space industry most excites or interests you? Uh, the ability to bring, this, I mean, as Patrick already mentioned it, I still have that picture of those two boosters landing almost simultaneously in my head. I mean, that's just absolutely astounding. And I think, again, what that will be to, there's a growth in CubeSats. I know many of the, the, the SEDS groups around the country and the world have got a lot of experience in CubeSats. What that can bring and the application of earth remote sensing data coupled to things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, what it can do for agriculture, what it can do for climate uh, monitoring, what it can do for a whole range of, of topics, um, I think that's going to revolutionize things because if you can build something that is very functional and put it on something that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, you can do a lot on the ground new battery technology, so we all saw some really great things that will, will spin out of that. And I hope most of the people, in, well obviously the audience, but all, online, are the same age as the people in the audience, because it's you all, or all you all, that's going to make it happen. Um, no, it's, we can sort of say what we'd like to happen, but it's going to be you guys that make it happen. And, um, your imagination is what drives it, so don't, don't be afraid to imagine what we can. I got a question for Dr. Alexander. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you started off and started with solid state physics and then you ended up in exoplanets. Is that right? No, I actually I did my PhD in cosmology and the oh, okay. universe. I actually, I actually worked in what was, before we called it dark energy, I worked with a cosmological constant and we weren't brave enough to call it dark energy. <laughs> um, and then I switched to solar physics. Then I went to Lockheed Martin and became you know, somebody who helped design missions for solar physics and then I came here as a solar physicist. Recently, uh, we've been expanding into the exoplanet world. So, um, I really did not like solid state physics. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, we have a very big group here, as I call condensed matter and uh, atomic molecular optical physics. Uh, really amazing stuff that's happening in that world. Um, I just did not like it. So, I'm sorry, you're interested in solid state physics? Yeah, uh, that's what my that's all right. There's a culture and physics department of some really cool stuff going on. Can I ask you a different question? How did you do this transition through like Lockheed Martin and like, industry and academia? Well, I was really lucky. And I think um, part of the reason was the thing that brought me to the United States was someone from Lockheed Martin who had to be an astronaut or he had a payload specialist. He flew once, went home, he took care of him time, went home to Montana, and he was looking to start a new group. And that, uh, by some kind of weird coincidence that I ended up being me. Um, but most of the funding came from Lockheed Martin who were building these missions to study the sun. And so uh, they basically, three years later, pinched me and took me down to Palo Alto. And so that's where we were building, um, building the spacecraft. Rice had a very, and still has a very, very strong space physics group, but they were looking to expand into solar physics. And somehow my name came up. I said no four times. The fifth time I said, okay, I'll come and talk to you. I've been here for 16 years. And then through the Space Institute, I've sort of transitioned a little bit towards more of trying to make the engineering and science come together. Um, again, it's easy looking back and watching, and it's a very clear path. Looking forward, which is most of what you're doing, you just never know what's going to happen. And a lot of it, to be honest, is a little bit of luck and being in the right place at the right time. And all you can do is prepare yourself to take advantage of that. Um, you never know. Whatever you're interested in today may not be what you're doing 20 years from now, even two years from now. Um, you just take the, take the opportunities when they come and always do something you want to do. Don't do something just because. Um, and you'd be surprised how successful you can be just um, with that. Thanks. Yep. Um, so, you know, talk a lot about 
industry has come a long way, especially like SpaceX, tell me that. Um, what is your thought between SpaceX and like our industry and governmental institutions for space exploration? Um, just because from professional that I've heard talk say that since you don't really have a way to make money, quote unquote, for, like for these uh, from the industry, at least like, going to space is only show money profiting. Um, the real only way to do it would be someone's willing to sink money into it, and like governments are really good at doing that. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on like, do you think industry is going to be the big push next, or if it's going to be a government like NASA or the Chinese Space um, Administration? I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, you make some very good points about innovation and government's role versus industry's role. You know, the space station was put up there 20 years ago, $120 billion ago. They're going to talk about all the medicines we're going to have, all the, all the uh, metal crystals and everything else we're going to have, super materials. And that really hasn't come out to be such a commercial success that we have hoped. Uh, it is a tough sale to go straight private. Um, there are some applications that you have to be having some money, uh, you know, with observing photographs, stuff like that. Um, but you're right. Uh, it is going to have to take some government support. Um, but I think if we follow this new model that NASA is working at, where they basically buy services to launch stuff and let the private sector innovate, uh, become efficient, and come up with these great designs, you know. Um, I, I too worked at Lockheed Martin, and people would say, well, SpaceX, you know, just landed the first stage of the Falcon 9. How come Lockheed Martin never did that? And my standard answer is NASA never asked us to. And that's, that's the truth, you know. When they went to SpaceX, they said, fly us to the uh, space station. We don't care what happens after that. Uh, well, then that opens up a lot of opportunities. And so I think with that sort of access to space, there will be a lot of push for different types of commercial applications in space. People will be able to make money from space. And you also have to keep in that mind NASA's uh, role. NASA's charter says space exploration. It doesn't say space colonization. It specifically excludes that terminology. So if you want to go and colonize Mars, you're not going to do it with NASA. NASA's not going to pay for that. So you have to think long term, some other scenario where that funding's going to become available. And what I would add to that, I mean, essentially the way you think about it is the government. You can, if you can say, I will help NASA, or if you're Chinese or Indian or some of these other space programs, I will help you achieve your exploration missions and it will be cheaper as long as I can control, which is the new model, I can control the thing I build. They know they've got guaranteed customers, so they've at least got a base that will keep them afloat, and then it's up to them to develop anything that comes next. And so there's a whole discussion about what's called the cislinear infrastructure. So that system of space is the orbit of the Earth, here to, here to the Moon, and then the orbit around the Moon, and maybe on the surface of the Moon. And, and there's some plans there that if you can mine water and sell the water to NASA, that's your base customer. NASA can use that water as water. They can use it as hydrogen and oxygen, which is rocket fuel, to get them onto Mars or whatever else they want to do. But you can also bring that rocket fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen, back to low Earth orbit and refuel telecommunications spacecraft in a geosynchronous orbit. If you can do that, those telecommunications companies do not have to set up a new satellite, which is a couple of billion dollar satellite. And so I'm not guaranteeing that all this will work, but those are the kind of ideas. And so for it to happen, government has to be an active partner, at least in the US model, the government has to be an active partner um, in the short term and let the innovation happen through these companies and how they monetize it that boost. If it works, then we'll all be flying to space in 10 years and taking holidays and next to, like we'll be, we'll have our beach chairs next to Christopher's Lake on Mars and um, wait for it to rain again. But, um, but that, I mean, if you don't dream like that, if you don't think of those things, it will never happen. And so I think it's great to <coughs> be thinking about it, even if some of it looks a little bit um, high in the sky. Do you have any more questions? Um, uh, person okay. Uh, I don't know if you've got it already, I was a little late, but I know that uh, NASA has sent probes before uh, to study the solar system and like other planets and sometimes, you know, the satellites. Uh, but I never heard anything that pushed beyond this limit, the solar system. 
is there any vision that actually happens or is happening or is going to happen in the future? Well, Voyager uh, was launched in the 1970s, and yes. that, that has been is continuing on and has now left the solar system. So that is our first and main mission that is going beyond the solar system. And others, we're basically developing more and more complex telescopes to look out beyond the solar system and figure out what might be there. And then, and then we've got folks looking into hypersonic, yeah, yeah. getting get as fast as we can, <laughs> moving faster. And we've also, we've, I mean, I used to work in solar sail technology, and so we designed an interstellar mission using a giant solar sail. And that's still in part being discussed. But the, 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 the thing that's happening there, there's a rich Russian um, who has created a thing called the Breakthrough Foundation, and there's a bunch of big prizes he gives out for innovative technologies. And, and his dream is to fly a very small satellite with a very small solar sail powered by a very high power laser. And he thinks he can get such a small spacecraft up to about 20% the speed of light, which means you can get to Proxima Centauri in 20 years. You can beam your data back in four years, and then you, you won't come back, you just go. But that is ambitious. Um, uh, I, that does the way it's achievable, but there are smart people than me out there working on it. Um, so there are some aspirations there. Um, in the meantime, Voyager is doing this job, you know. It's, it's, it's been traveling at 40,000 miles an hour for 50 years and it just reached the edge of the solar system, so kind of space is a, a little bit of the big side. It's, it's also worth adding that we are exploring space beyond the solar system by allowing the space to come to us in the form of light from distant stars and galaxies. And in that way, we're also making maps in the same way, that, not the same way, but analogous to the way in which we'll make a map of the surface of Mars, we make maps of the distributions of galaxies throughout the universe, and although those distances are now millions of light years, billions of light years away, we're not going to get there anytime soon, uh, we're learning a wealth of information about um, the universe in which we live um, when it arrives here at Earth in the telescopes. Okay, so did we have a question from the live stream? Yes, we do. Uh, from John Smith, uh, for Dr. Long, uh, what are your thoughts on the search for a neutron electric dipole moment as it relates to uh, baryogenesis? Hey, that's, a, that's a very astute <laughs> question. Yes. Um, John Smith must be an alien. Yeah, right. I, right. I should have uh, arranged this. I guess the short answer, um, just uh, to provide some context, is that. Um, one imagines a distribution of charged particles, um, then we can describe different properties of those charged particles. We can ask what's the total amount of charge. You take all the pluses and subtract all the minuses. Um, but you can ask things about how are those charges arranged in space. And um, one of those properties is called the electric dipole moment. It's just telling you are the charges separated in space. Um, a particle like a neutron, um, which is a little ball full of quarks, has no total charge, um, but it may have an electric dipole moment, meaning that the constituents may have be separated. The charged constituents may be separated in space, and um, the separation is related in a uh, technical way to the fact that there's more matter than antimatter in the universe today. Uh, we produce particles of antimatter in the laboratory, and we see them sometimes arriving at Earth when they're produced um, high energy environments like centers of galaxies. But um, by and large, the universe is entirely matter rather than antimatter. And so um, the question then is if I want to explain why there's more matter than antimatter, I'm making some prediction for the size of the neutron's electric dipole moment. And it turns out that in many theories now that prediction is in conflict with very precise uh, upper limits on the size of neutrons electric dipole moment. And so um, this uh, connection between cosmology observables of excess of matter or antimatter and particle physics observables is kind of characteristic of um, this interface between particle physics and cosmology. The short answer is that those, those particular theories are dead. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. General question to all of you: Do you think that we'll ever know everything there is to know about this, like one aspect of like, space? Like, we'll have discovered everything like that goes into, say, a certain type of star. It's 
Maybe. That's the an answer right now. That's the only one I know. Well, I think to a certain extent, everything is a model. And we just make the models better and better every time we see some sort of new data set that disagrees with our old model. Whether there's a final end to that process, um, I sort of doubt it, but only on sort of philosophical arguments. But each model is a little bit better, a little, little bit better. Whatever you're talking about, the models just get better with time. So you reach a point where you have to sort of think, are the models good enough to do that what we're trying to do? Now, that's the engine you're talking. Uh, but you do have to ask that question, when is good enough, good enough? I would say, I mean, I, I've said this to a lot of students, I, don't, I think I do believe it, but it's, if you're doing science, the end product of what you do is not an answer, it's new questions. And so, you may get to a level where you can actually, like Newton's law of gravity, and you can make it work, and then you find out regions where it doesn't work, and so you have to come up with a new theory, and you can push that further. So you're always trying to generate those questions because, um, uh, I mean, there are probably certain things, you know, like if this table only had one leg, it would be able to keep be stable. There's things you didn't know, but, but I think um, one of the things as human beings that keeps us, especially people like us who have been working at a university for a living, is that there is no end. And even when we pass, there will be students coming along behind us and their students and their students, everybody asking questions. Um, and we can only refine our knowledge, but whether we can ever, you can only prove something wrong, you can never prove it right. <laughs> if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if it works, you don't know if something works better. Um, and so it's a great it's a great environment to be in because this is I think what we're destined to be is as curious and inquisitive, whether it be exploring space. Exploring the early part of space, exploring the chunk of space, or exploring the how you travel through space. I think um, um, I'd rather I'd rather I, I hope the answer is no. We will never know. Okay, I think we, we have. Can have computer, yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Uh, um, what is the best argument in favor of colonizing Mars? Well. Uh, <laughs> Depends on whether you really. <laughs> I, this argument in favor. Now you've challenged me. Um, no, I, I mean it is. It's all about exploration. It's all about. Um, I mean, I think having a person go to the moon with Apollo, right, invigorated and inspired an entire generation of engineers and scientists and new developments that are just absolutely not what we would have anticipated even beforehand or as we were getting ready for it. Um, and so, with every stage of exploration, you, you, every every time you try to take on a problem that seems unsolvable, um, you inspire, you know, way more innovation than than you do if you just try to kind of uh, keep things at the status quo. And so, problems like how could we possibly colonize Mars will continue to inspire new innovations, new people. Uh, new discoveries uh, for a long time. I think I think Earth is we, we don't give Earth enough credit for being a very comfortable place designed just for humans, <laughs> uh, or ended up being just the right place for humans. We're designed just for it. Whatever the case is, um, Mars is not going to be a comfortable environment for us. Uh, certainly, having people on the surface, even just getting to any stage of of sending people to the surface and kind of figuring out the challenges of sending people there, keeping people there, keeping people happy while they're there, right? Every one of those will inspire innovation in tons of fields. I mean, it'll inspire innovation in fashion as how do you get clothing that they can wear without having the same kind of access to water or laundry. Um, so I think as we, as we continue to push that drive towards exploration, whatever your end goal is, each of those end goals will inspire ongoing innovation. We need to be as few humans because they can break in many different ways and unpredictable ways. And they whine when they break, and so, so the, I think that's what I think Kristen said as as, as perfectly as you can, and that is the challenges you have with a human involved means that whatever you develop, rec rec uh, reclaiming your water, generating uh, uh, sufficient power for the, the, your whole duration, uh, keeping things uh, small and light and versatile, are all applicable to problems on the planet, and. I think that's to, to me is, I mean, if you just want
want to do for a little bit of science and a little bit and a little less money, send robots and if they break, you don't cry. But if you want to, to use that exploration to drive benefits back home, robotic has benefits, but um, I think sending a human and keeping them alive, bringing them back, you can do that, you can do almost, and this is the Apollo legacy, if you can do that, you can do almost anything, which is why everything's called a moonshot, solving cancer, curing cancer, doing all these different things. So, so the inspiration sometimes gets laughed at, but I think it's I think it's one of the crucial aspects of why we can really do in addition to the actual tangible benefits of the technologies that benefit us. I'd like to add in the in the long term, I think a, a good philosophical argument would be you know putting our species on two separate planets. You know, there's still a lot of asteroids and things flying around the solar system. We wouldn't want the Earth to get whacked. We're designed to live on Earth, and if Earth changes, we're in a whole lot of hurt. And so if we can have our species on a second body, whether it's Mars or something else, and that gives us some continuity, some guarantee of the future. That's a way out there justification, but I think there's some logic to it. All right, so we are just about at time. So thank you to our panelists for your time, for sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate it. So if we can give them a short round of applause. <laughs> and yeah, we have pizza, some giveaways in the back. Um, so feel free to take some. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and again, thank you to the panelists. We really appreciate it. And I just have one more thing before you all go. Um, so our next event is the Owls in Space Symposium on February 22nd, that's a Saturday, in Duncan Hall. Um, it will be live streamed as well for all of you that online who can't make it. Um, we have the Johnson Space Center Director, Mark Geyer, as our keynote. We have over 15 companies in attendance for our career fair and reception. And we just learned this week that we also will have a special guest speaker, the Deputy Associate Administrator of NASA, um, Melanie Saunders will also be in attendance. So hopefully all of you guys can come, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you again.